Good morning, everybody. Well, the poor, the poor left side's all lonely. It's okay. Hi, people on the right. My right. Uh, well, it looks like we're gonna have a few more people trickle in. That's okay. Today's it's okay for people to just kind of meander in, and um, I still hope that you know, even if even if we're not all like. Just jumping out of our seats full of energy and excitement this morning. Or are, are some of you guys like that? No, okay. I didn't think so. Tyler just, I saw him jump out of the seat. <laughs> anyway, I hope that today is still a good day. I hope that today is a day that you are grateful to be here, that you are grateful for the many blessings in our lives, grateful that we have a God that loves us, grateful for our Savior. And I hope that um, today we're able to just turn that and let's, let's use that and use all of that thankfulness, all that gratitude that we have. Let's turn that towards God with some songs this morning. So I encourage you, please, if you're here live with us, let's stand up, start out with a couple of fun songs.
Go get the cranberry juice out. <laughs> get a bagel. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. But so now's the time to just prepare ourselves. And um, um, something that something that's been on my mind the last couple of weeks is I've had a really hard time settling down my brain. And it's but it's it's really consuming me in not a good way. It, it's, I've been losing sleep. I've, you know, sometimes just been distracted from what's going on right in front of me. I'm having a harder time focusing on reading the Bible and praying. Like, I try to do those things, but they're not then, like, the overwhelming energy, so to speak, at that time. There's just other things on my mind, and it's been so hard to settle my brain down. 
And so for me, this morning, this song was really important for me because I was like, I, I have been consumed by stress. I've been consumed by, um, and, and, and even if it's good things, it's still something that my brain is on and taking away from my time with my family, my time with God, my time with the things that are important in front of me right now. And so this morning in prep for communion, I really wanted the chance to sing it out like, God, I want you to be the one that consumes me. I want the spirit to be that consuming presence, the thing that my brain can't get away from, the thing that above all else I'm distracted by. What a thought is that, to be distracted by God, to be distracted by the Holy Spirit. And I'm so grateful. I really am. There's so many good things in my life, but... Today, I want to be distracted by God. I want Him to be what is consuming my thoughts this morning. And so, for whatever you're bringing here today, I hope that you're able to spend some time in prayer and join me because I need to do this as well. Join me in praying just for that chance to clear our minds of anything that isn't from God. Join, join me in the chance to kind of refresh our brain and be able to focus on Him and just worship Him, give Him the praise that He deserves this morning. Thank you. 
song. Thank you for Amy. You wrote it for us. And this is the chance to be able to celebrate uh, your Lordship in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us on the cross. We, we really don't want to ever, ever, ever get, get tired of this, of what you did for us. Thank you that we can celebrate using these symbols that represent your body and your blood that were broken for us. Thank you that through this table we can also symbolically give our lives to you again. We can put ourselves on this altar. And so we use this time, Lord. Search our hearts. See if there be any wicked way in us and lead us in the way everlasting, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a seat. Uh, uh, Carmen, read a section from Romans 3. A beautiful, beautiful section of what Jesus did for us. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, for he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Amen. We're going to do something we've never done before, I don't think, at least not on purpose. I'm going to have all of you, uh, when you're ready, those who want to participate, to come get a piece of bread and a cup. And we, since we're not a massive group this morning, we've got this open space in the middle. Let's make a circle. Let's make a circle together and not not, partic- not uh, eat the elements until we're, we're all ready, okay? You like that idea? Yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> it, another symbol of just, again, of us. So it's, this is us together coming to the cross, right? We're remembering what Jesus did for us. So when you're ready, come on up and... And then form that circle in the back, would you please? Thank you. 
salvation. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. On that night at the Last Supper, he took the bread and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember, remember what I did for you. Let's take it together, all right? around the circle. Jesus died for your friends here. He died for all of you. He'd do it all over again. He loves us that much. On that same night he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you as a new covenant. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let's take it Sing that chorus again. Jesus Messiah. You guys can start making your way back. Thank you. sacrifice. Thank you for the love that you have shown to us. And most amazing of all, we know that that is a free gift for us. That all we have to do is cry out to you. All we have to do is believe in you. Lord God, help us today to be able to put our focus on you. Help us to be able to just show the gratitude to you that you deserve, Lord. We are so grateful. We are so thankful for everything. Thank you for this group of people. Thank you for just this beautiful day. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of y'all have hands? All right? Get them together on this side. There's tambourines in the back even if you want. I'll I'll let you do it. I'll let you do it if you want. Let's stand together. Let's sing John 3, 16.
And then we're doing investigating Jesus in th two Sundays after this, right? And uh, so if you have, uh, have not gotten any invite cards that you want to give to some people, please go back there or up here in the front. We'll put them up there as well. And uh, hopefully we're going to get back on Facebook again uh, this, this week or so and, and uh, try to get the word out. Okay? So thank you for being a part of that. I know that we can really own this opportunity for us to try to meet some new people and maybe see who God's tugging at out in our community, right? If you have an offering, you can put it back there in the back white table, and we'll see you back in a few minutes. All right, everybody, thank you. Thank you. 
Let's start making our way back to spots. Find your Bibles. Thank you. We are in Ephesians 5 this morning. If you can find your spot there. We'll also have the scriptures up on the screen for you. If you would like that, prefer that. Since we're starting a brand new series in a couple of weeks, I thought we need to kind of fast track through the rest of Ephesians 5 this morning. So we're going to do a lot. Uh, I want you to take the time this week. I want to challenge you to read Ephesians 5, like 1 through 20. Just enjoy what I would call a great summary of all of Ephesians 4 and 5. I've been talking about all the things that we've already been talking about. And uh, it's, it's just a beautiful, all these great commands from Paul that are very challenging. He reminds us and Ephesian believers how to put on the new nature of Christ in our life. How to put on that new person. So he talks about things like sexual purity. He talks about things like greed and how greed can kill us, destroy us. He talks about foul language again. Again, he talked about this already in Ephesians 4, right? Paul is basically saying here in, in the middle of Ephesians 5 is, wake up, wake up. It's time to get, you know, he uses an Old Testament scripture, if you see it there, where it says, wake up, old sleeper. Wake up, you know, and he's, he's just, he just wants to challenge us all to, come on, guys, this is different. We are different than the world. We're different than the world. If we want people to come to Jesus, they need to see the light of Jesus shining out of our lives, right? So he, he concludes all this with this wonderful passage right there, 15 through 20. And I want to take the time just to read it and just enjoy this beautiful, again, summary of what it means to put on the new nature. He says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but in, understand what the Lord wants you to do. And don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't explain it, he just says, do it, be filled. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Singing psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. Why do we have so much music in our church services? Because of this verse. And the one in Colossians as well. I love it. And then finally, give thanks for a few things, if you feel like it. Give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't those just great, great words to be inspired by? That's the summary. With all that as a reminder of what Paul is sharing in Ephesians 4 and 5, he now switches to a brand new topic. Marriage. Oh, put a smile on your face, everybody. This is going to be good. This is going to be good. This is, this is, this is one, one of the very few specific passages in Scripture talking about matrimony. 
uh, and it does a pretty incredible job. Uh, when I think of proper biblical marriage, look up on the screen, would you? This is what I think of. <laughs> right? This is what it's all about, right? The photo says it all, right? Barefoot, pregnant, in the kitchen. No, no, no. I'm, we're joking here. This, this is actually a photo of Bonnie, if you can't tell, my wife. We took this photo as a joke many, many years ago. How old are you, Nick? 32. 32. So that's Nick in the tummy there. And uh, uh, so that was a long time. So we did it as a joke, obviously. We did it as a joke. Uh, we're actually for Jeff Kramer's best friend, is what we who we originally did it for. Yeah. But marriage, let's face it, marriage is kind of confusing. Marriage these days is complicated. It, it's, it's, a, it's a great institution of God, but boy, it is difficult and challenging and a little bit confusing these days. We all know how hard it is to be in a healthy marriage. Whether, whether you've ever been married or not, you still know what it looks like. You know what a healthy marriage looks like. You can tell. And, and, and you also probably know all the negative statistics that are all around us in America, right? How many divorces? How many of this? How many of that? There's, it's bleak when you look at things like that. The odds aren't good. But when marriage among Christ followers is done right... It is the most beautiful thing that there is. It's blessed. Marriage done right is actually a reenactment of grace. Marriage done right is actually a reenactment of the gospel. Even like what we celebrated here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how in just a second. I heard someone once say this about marriage. Marriage is like a three ring circus. The engagement ring. The wedding ring. And the suffering. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that way though, right? It doesn't have to be. I got, I got lots of marriage jokes. Went, went marriage, yeah. I can't help it. Those are so, so funny. This is why I love this one. Farmer Brown approached his neighbor's barn and he saw Farmer Jones serenading a tractor with songs and compliments. And Farmer Brown goes up and says, what are you doing? And Farmer Jones says, well, my wife and I have been having marriage problems. So we went to a counselor, and the marriage counselor said I needed to do something sexy to attract her. <laughs> oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. that was a good one. I apologize for that. For some of us, Ephesians 5 is a very well known passage. We've studied it, it's very common. Others, if you're hearing it for the first or second time, or it's kind of like, Whoa, what is being said here? It's kind of shocking, isn't it? I imagine you might have some questions if you're looking at it for the first time. Some think that when they read this, Paul is like treating wives like, like they're cattle, treating them like they're property or slaves, and that they must do exactly what the husband says 100% of the time, and that's what it's all about, because man's in charge and women are not, you know, that kind of thing. And... If any of you have been in an unhealthy relationship that kind of looked like that, it's, you know how devastating it is. And I think you know that that's not what Paul is trying to say here. It's certainly not what God wants for our marriages. So I hope that you have open ears this morning to hear. Uh, they are strong words. They can be conf confusing at first, but I hope by the end of this time today, maybe you'll have a better understanding. If, if we read it or study a passage that doesn't make sense, what do we do? Do we just move on? I always suggest ask lots of questions, number one. Ask lots of questions. What is Paul saying here? What's going on? Who, 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 who's he talking to? All these. Ask the questions. And then secondly, know the context of which Paul is talking about in this case. What's the context going on? Because we believe the Bible speaks to us today, 2022. But it, there was a first century context when Paul first wrote this to the Ephesian believers. And so sometimes it's not always easy to make sense of it in our time, right? But it's fun to try. And it, it's, it's, it's an adventure, let me tell you. I love it. It's, and it's always rewarding to me. I've never been disappointed yet. Because when we ask these questions, I think this passage completely changes from what, how some people view it. They view it as a real negative or a real despairing thing. I see it just the opposite now. Because I understand the context. So with all that, are you ready to get into the text? 
Listen, listen closely. Paul is not belittling women. Wives, he's not condemning them. It's life-giving what he's sharing, especially to women. Especially to women. Let, let's prove it. Let's find out together. Here we go. Verse 21. And further, submit to one another. Submit to each other. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submitting to your husbands as to the Lord. And for a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of his body, the church. And as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Still with me? You okay so far? <laughs> husbands, this means you love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present the church, her, to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are all members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. It's a great mystery. But it's an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Love and respect. Those are two great words. Love and respect. We'll talk more about that as we continue on. As you might know, this passage is also famous for what many feel is especially degrading to women. That word, submit has surely raised eyebrows over the years. Do you see submit as a positive word or as a negative word? Yeah, I think most people in our culture, they see it as a negative word, probably, right? It's, it's a negative word. Let's study this just a little bit deeper. Submit to one, and that's how the whole thing starts. It's all about submitting to each other. Very generally. And, and, so is this just for women here? No, no of course not. It's the entire Christian community. We submit out of reverence for Christ. How would you define submission? When we talk about the negative idea, I think of words like dominated or being passive or weak, losing your dignity. I mean, there's, nothing, there's nothing empowering about those words, that idea. But I don't really think that's what Paul means by submit. I think in his first century context, he means something completely different. When um, the biblical authors use that word submit, they usually, this is what they're really trying to say, I think. See if this makes sense to you. Submitting, biblically, means to prioritize the interests and the well-being of others above your own. You're, you're putting others above yourself. You're putting yourself under them. That, that word submit actually means to put under. Under the success, the blessings of others. That's, that's your goal of submission. And I think it really fits closely with what I would call a biblical definition of love. It's a real basic definition here. But to me, love is an action. It's a commitment to act for the well-being of others. That's love. So I see the two words being quite synonymous in Paul's thinking. In Paul's thinking. You guys, you guys know this verse in Philippians 2. It's a great example of what we're talking about. Don't just look out for your own interests, but what? The interests of others, right? Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So I believe that love and submission go together. They're both very positive. They're both healthy words, but sometimes confusing. I admit that. Back to verse 22. After Paul commands everybody to submit... Now he specifically tells the wives to submit. And then in verse 25, he tells the husbands that they are to love their wives. 
So does that mean that the wives aren't supposed to love? Is, is that what Paul's saying? It, are, are, are the men, are the husbands not to submit? Is that what Paul, Paul's saying here? I don't think so at all. It's both and. It's not either or, right? And so to me, this deals with this first issue of that word submit. It's not as scary as you think, ladies. To, it, to be a submissive wife is not a negative thing. It's a, it's a very positive thing. It's another it's synonymous with love. It's, your, it's your, your, you're putting your husband above yourself out of love. Out of love. So I hope that's helpful. Let's move to the second issue in this crazy passage. And that's in verse 23 when it says, The husband is the head of the wife. What's going on here? Okay, Rob, try to get yourself out of this one. All right? The husband is the head of the wife. Yikes. Let's go back to first century Ephesus, Roman Empire. Was Ephesus a Jewish city or a Roman city? Remember? It was Roman, very, very Roman. There were some Jews there, but it was a very large, in fact, they think the largest city population of the Roman Empire at that time. So if, if Ephesus is very Roman. Paul is writing to Roman people here, all right? What was the chain of command in the Roman Empire? What was the, how, did it, how did it work back in those days? You might find it interesting. The first one, obviously, was Caesar, right? The emperor. Emperor was everything. In fact, they considered him godlike. Um, and so that was, he was always number one. And then the second were the, what I would call the ruling elite. Mostly rich people. These are the people that would govern, the senators and the other people, and they would run things. Uh, only Like only 4% of the population were the ruling elite, a very small group of people, but they had a lot of power, a lot of command. After the ruling elite, they got more specific. I would just put men here. Men. Gender, men. All right? And then under that, guess who? Women. Right? Women were always under men in the first century. That was how the chain of command went. And then finally, I just put children and slaves, kind of put that together because I ran out of room. Okay? So um, I, don't, I didn't put pets up there or anything like that. Just children and slaves is pretty much about as low as the Roman Empire went as far as the chain of command. So the men were naturally considered the head of the household in first century Roman Empire. A, a man, this is how it worked. They would purchase a wife. Remember that? Remember hearing about that? They, they would go, they would find another, another parent, a dad, say, I'd like to marry your wife. How much does she cost? And he would be in charge. Okay, that's just how it was done back then. Uh, the average age of a man when he got married in the first century, any guesses? 30. Ex exactly, exactly. About 30 years old. They usually waited till then. Any guesses about the woman? 14. 14 or 15. Really? Yeah. 14 or 15 was very common. That's creepy. <laughs> it just kind of feels very creepy to us. But it was commonplace back then. And so I don't know if you can picture this teenage girl. This teenage girl taking care of the children. Taking... She was also in charge of the servants. That was her job. That was, that was her duty and really her value. Her value was taking care of the children and the slaves. So, when Christianity came on the picture, this is beautiful, guys. Check this out. When Christianity hit the Roman Empire, we all know that many things changed. In that new community... They did things based on Jesus' words and not on the Roman Empire. So instead of the hierarchy that we have here that we looked at, the early church lived following words like, For you are all children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. And all of you were united with Christ in baptism and have clothed yourself with Christ. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the mantra that they used back then in the early church. They changed it all around. The chain of command completely changed. 
Every single human being is of equal value to God, and they did their best to do the same. They tried. So now, in that context, understanding what was happening then and what Paul wanted to bring Jesus' words and, and practices to this church, look at 25 again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. That doesn't sound like the Roman Empire chain of command to me. Someone who is the head doesn't give up their life for this, the person underneath, right? The head of the first century household was commanded to do what? To take care of things. But as a believer, what was he asked to do? To love his wife the same way Jesus loved him. Yeah, love the church. And Christ, we know, put himself under the church. He actually put himself, he submitted himself and put himself under the church. And husbands are supposed to do the exact same thing. Put himself under his wife. That's what Paul is saying. You give up your life for that girl. She's not there to serve you. You're there to serve her. And that's a whole new way of organizing households in the first century. It sounds so basic. Let me, let me just try to clarify what this kind of sacrificial love really means. Back in verse 23, when it says that Christ is the head of the church, in this context we've been talking about, where's Christ again? He's under the church, right? He's submitted to the church. He put himself under and gave up his life for the church. We celebrated the, the, the Last Supper, that, uh, celebrating that Jesus put himself under the church. Not like Jesus is the emperor. It's not like he was that at all. He wasn't Caesar. He wasn't a dictator. He became a servant, right? And so when Paul writes that husbands are supposed to be the head of the wife, what is he really saying? What's he really saying? Is he talking about absolute male authority here? Is that what's going on? That's how it was for centuries. Sometimes it still is that way. I don't think he's saying that at all. I think his description of the headship is the example of Christ. It's rooted in the gospel. Christian husbands then, I'm, I'm repeating myself a lot because I just want to make sure you got it. Christian husbands are to make it a priority to lay down their lives, their well-being to their wives so that they can flourish. And Christian wives, you're to reciprocate. You respond the same way so that your husbands can flourish. That's what it's supposed to look like. That's what it's supposed to look like. And if a couple practices this constantly, I think they've got a pretty good chance of having a very healthy Christian marriage. Wouldn't we all want that? Wouldn't we all wish for this for ourselves and for our, our brothers and sisters? Mutual submission. Mutual love. So if both the wife and the husband are mutually submitted to each other, who loses? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. That's right. If they both win. It's a win-win. And I think that's the vision of marriage in the Bible. This passage, this passage actually challenges male abuse of authority. It does not support it at all. It's talking about true, pure love. All right. So what? Let's come back to the 21st century again as we try to make sense of this in our lives and our relationships. Not just marriage relationships, really all relationships. Let's ask that age-old question. How do we put this teaching into practice in all of our relationships? Uh, as we think about this, it's important that you remember something. Remember that Jesus was single. Jesus was single. Who wrote Ephesians? Paul? Paul was single. So it's not like this, the haves and the have-nots and the do's and the do-nots. It's, it's, it's this balance of things that's happening here. I don't pretend to have it all figured out, but I can ask myself, does my life tell that story of love and submission and respect? Does my life tell the story? You need to ask yourself that as well. Does it reenact? Does my life reenact the story of Christ's love and sacrifice? Am I becoming this kind of Christ follower? 
Of course, none of us would raise our hand and say we, we, we've arrived. Um, got a long ways to go. I've learned a lot in my marriage, which we celebrated 37 years this, this last week. So. Yeah. Uh, in my wife's journey of cancer, I'm going to go ahead and share some of this. I'm sorry to bump you guys out. But, uh, and it's been a journey of nearly 15 years now. And you've all been a part of it. Most of you have been a part of that for a long, long time. Uh, during that time, we've gone to lots of hospitals, probably over 10. And we've been to tons of doctor's offices over the years. I'm talking lots and lots and lots. And we go through this almost comical routine every time, Bonnie and I, as, as, we, as we're involved in this. It goes something like this. Your body's usually in bed, either recovering or waiting for a doctor. And after sitting around, I'm, I'm, at, I'm at her side, right? And in her room, I'm trying to keep myself occupied. You know, I'm bored. I don't want to be there, really, honestly. But I, I'm either watching TV if the room has a TV, or reading, or I'm studying, or playing a game on my phone. I like to play, um, let's see if I can say it right, Sud Sudoku? Sudoku? Is that how you say it? I love that game. Like I got that on my phone. It's fun. It makes me feel smart. Um, and and so that's just how it always goes. And, and, and I'm there for Bonnie if she needs me. And that's how it always goes. And then Bonnie will always say to me, all every single time, like more than 20 times, hey, Rob, you know what? Why don't you, why don't you just go home? Or why don't you go, go back to the hotel? Why, why don't you just chill out? You don't need to be here. I don't really need you here. Everything's fine. I'll be good. Why don't you go get some coffee? You know, you, you know, I just feel sorry for you. And, and then so after that, I always respond to Bonnie. And it's like we know this is going to happen, and we do this every single time. I always respond, I'm good. I'm good. Right now, this is my job. You're my job. I'm here for you. This is what the, those vows were all about, right? Health, health and sickness and all that. And it's one way that I can love my wife. I can just show her that submissive love. I wouldn't wish this on anybody, but I'll do it gladly. I'm not sharing that because I'm perfect. I'm just saying it's it's just all of you. All of you have been in similar situations, haven't you? In in, in your different relationships, and you you do something for a loved one just because you love them. You do it just because of that reason. And maybe you feel like you have to do it, but with the right attitude, man. With using Christ's example, right? We gladly submit to them without any thought. Of ourselves. I think that helps to answer the so what question. And so I think our goal in every situation is to be the hands and feet of Jesus in marriages and in every other situation. I do want to point to the very last verse, 33. I think it's such a great reminder of what this is all about love and respect. For some reason, Paul now changes the word. It's actually a different Greek word respect. Why didn't he just do this from the beginning? Why didn't he just use the word respect from the beginning, take out submit? That would have made it so much easier for all of us, I think. I, that's a question I have for Paul later on. Um, what's the opposite of this? What's the opposite of love and respect? Pretty obvious, right? Hate. Disrespect. Putting people down. Putting yourself above someone else, right? It's the very opposite of what Christ is asking of us. Paul, Paul and the Lord is asking us to, to, to live out love and respect for each other. Actively looking for ways to love and respect the people in our relationships. Actively. Build them up. Consider their well-being above your own. Let me, let me close this morning by giving you an overview of what love and respect might look like in a marriage, and, and honestly, most relationships. Uh, I've, this is my favorite book on marriage. It's uh, called Love and Respect. I've shared it with some of you before, and we've talked about things in it. Dr. Emerson Egerich, I love his name. It's such a cool name. But I love this because it's very, very, very practical, very specific, very helpful with lots of tools. And one of the tools he uses is an acrostic say, okay, guys, Husbands here, people, you know, men, this is how you can spell love to your wife. Use, use the acrostic couple. Now, this is, these are generalizations, okay? And, don't, and don't, don't get freaked out by it. Maybe some of these like, ah, that's not what I want in marriage. You know, that's not, but, but generally, 
uh, Dr. Eggrich thinks this is how you spell love to your wife. Closeness. Intimacy. She wants you to be close. Openness. She wants you to actually open up, talk once in a while, right? Um, understanding. Sometimes she doesn't want you to fix her. She just wants you to, to listen. And guys, we need to remember that. Peacemaking. She actually wants you to say, I'm sorry, once in a while. <laughs> Loyalty. She needs to know you're committed. I think that's a big deal. And then esteem. She wants you to honor her. So the acrostic couple, if you can remember that. Um, I've got this in the bulletin, uh, in your email or online, and, or you can take a picture of this later on if you want. How about, how about wives for the husbands? What, what sh he spells the word chairs. Right? <laughs> Uh, like he, he struggled with this one, didn't he? <laughs> Couple made sense. <laughs> Chairs, I'm not so sure. Anyway, but anyway, I, I, now I, I can remember it though. Conquest. <clears throat> I don't agree with all these 100%. I just want you to know that. But this is what he wrote. Conquest. Appreciate his desire to work and achieve. Hierarchy. Desire. Appreciate his desire to protect and to provide. Yeah, okay, Maybe. Authority. Again, these are really strong words. Appreciate his desire to serve and to lead. Insight. Appreciate his desire to analyze and counsel. So sometimes he doesn't want to just listen. <laughs> sometimes we have things to say. Sometimes we think we maybe can fix it. And being willing just to appreciate that. Uh, relationship. Uh, this is interesting. Appreciate his desire for quiet friendship. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? I don't know. And then sexuality, appreciate his desire for sexual intimacy. It seems to me the women would want the same thing. But that's how he spells love for husbands from the wives. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but I just thought I'd just throw out some little tools, some things maybe for you to think about in all of your relationships. How are you living this out today? Love and respect. Man, this is so practical. I love it. I love it. I hope you love it because it's five as much as I do. Let's pray together. Thank you for, oh, thank you for bringing the first century to the 21st century and making this passage just as practical today as it was back then. I pray for the marriages that are here. I pray for the different relationships. And mostly, Lord, we come to you, again, in this, this attitude of sacrifice, this attitude of surrender, putting ourselves on the altar, and we want to submit to you we want to submit to each other and in the cases where it's specifically where we can submit to our spouses in love and respect. Easy to talk about, hard to do, hard to put into practice. Because sometimes, Lord, we feel like we're getting stepped on. Sometimes, Lord, we feel like that doormat. Help us, Lord, to follow the example of Christ who loved the church, who loved the church and gave up his life for her. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings on you guys. Have a great last week of August. <laughs>